Spermidine extends lifespan in mice and in people is associated with reduced all-cause mortality risk and improves cognitive function in randomized controlled trials. Now, the first study that suggested a role for spermidine on extension of mammalian lifespan was published in 2009, and that study is shown here. Now, in that study, which was started at 24 weeks of age in male JC1 ICR mice, these mice were fed three different diets, either low, normal, or high levels of polyamines. So what are polyamines? Poly means many, and amine means the amino group, so NH2, nitrogen and hydrogen. Now, three popular polyamines are putrescine, which con contains two amino groups, spermidine, which contains three amino groups, and spermine, which contains four amino groups. All right, so back to the study. So when looking at the average survival, or the time when half the population was dead and half was still alive, so 50% survival, we can evaluate median lifespan. So first, we can see that there was no difference in survival for the low versus normal polyamine diets. But then we can see a significant extension of uh, median lifespan when comparing the high polyamine diet to the normal polyamine diet. So which polyamine may be responsible for the extended lifespan? And to answer that, let's take a look at the diet composition in terms of levels of the three polyamines, putrescine, spermidine, and spermine. And that's what's shown here. So starting from the left to the right, we've got data for uh, the low, normal, and high polyamine diets. Now, first note, in terms of macronutrients, there were no significant differences in the amount of protein, fat, fiber, or calorie um, uh, content for these three different diets. But then we see differences for polyamine levels, obviously, between the three diets. So first, we can see that putrescine, when comparing the high with the normal polyamine diet, was 1.7-fold higher uh, in the high polyamine diet when compared with the normal polyamine diet. And then spermine was 2.3-fold higher in the high polyamine chow when compared with the normal polyamine chow. But then the biggest differences for polyamines was for spermidine. And we can see that first in terms of absolute content, uh, the highest levels of all three of these polyamines was greatest for spermidine, which had 1540 nan nanomoles per gram in the high polyamine diet when compared with, put with, compared with putrescine, which had 1,075 nanomoles per gram. And then the fold difference when comparing the high versus the normal polyamine uh, diets was greatest for spermidine, which is 3.5-fold higher when comparing those two diets. So what about blood levels of uh, polyamines when comparing the uh, high polyamine diet with the normal polyamine diet? And that's what we can see here. So starting with the spermine concentration, after 8 and 16 weeks on the diet, there were no differences between the normal and high polyamine diets. And then although it, lo it looks like there's a uh, doubling of the blood spermine concentration after 26 weeks on the diet, you know, 10.1 versus 5.2 uh, micromolar, that uh, those differences were not statistically significant. Uh, we can see by the p-value of 0.09. Uh, there was some variability. The authors of the study reported that there was variability in the spermine concentration in the high polyamine group, which you can see by the standard deviation of 7.1 in the high polyamine uh, diet group for spermine. All right, so what about blood levels of spermidine? So once again, after 8 and 16 weeks on the diet, there were no differences between the normal and high polyamine diets. But after 26 weeks on the diet, we can see about a 50 or a close to a 50% increase in blood levels of spermidine on the high polyamine diet when compared with the normal polyamine diet. Now, blood levels of putrescine were not measured, so uh, we can't rule out that uh, levels of putrescine, at least in, in blood, may have contributed to the lifespan extending effect of the high polyamine child versus the normal. But when considering that spermidine content, uh, dietary content and blood levels were significantly higher in the high polyamine diet when compared with the normal polyamine diet, this suggested that spermidine on its own may impact lifespan. And it does, as we can see here. So this study was uh, seven years later in 2016. Uh, female C57 black 6J mice were fed spermidine in the drinking water starting at four months of age. So starting very early in life, this is close to uh, uh, about being a teenager in human years. And when looking at median survival, so again, the 50% survival, half the population is dead, half is still alive, we can see that signif significantly increased median lifespan, as indicated by the green arrow, in the mice that were fed spermidine when compared with mice that were not fe fed spermidine, the controls. Now, what about uh, su spermidine uh, supplementation initiated later in life? Can that extend lifespan? So the authors of this study also evaluated that, and that's what we can see here. So in this case, uh, both male and female C57 black 6J mice were fed, again, spermidine in the drinking water, but this time they started it at 18 months of age, which is closer to middle age for a mouse, which has uh, a usual um, maximal lifespan of about 40, 40 months. 
So once again, we can see that the spermidine supplemented group had an increased median lifespan. Well, what about other studies? One study is nice for being able to extend lifespan with, for, uh, with spermidine, but what about have other studies replicated spermidine's lifespan extending effect? And they have. So in a study published in 2017, uh, in this case using 10 times the concentration of spermidine as in the previous study, uh, 3 millimolar in the drinking water, and this time supplementing from birth. So uh, as soon as the mice were born, they were supplemented with spermidine in the drinking water, so essentially for the duration of their lifespan. And when uh, comparing median survival again, we can see that significant extension of median survival in the spermidine supplemented mice when compared with controls. Now, although it looks like maximal lifespan may have also been impacted, that wasn't evaluated or reported in the study. But interestingly, note that spermidine does not increase lifespan in rats. And uh, in this case, it was a, uh, the study was initiated or spermidine was supplemented uh, later in life, uh, in this case at 18 months of age, uh, and again, it was supplemented in the drinking water. And although there was an approximate doubling of the spermidine concentration in blood, which showed that they were uh, ingesting uh, uh, the spermidine in the water as opposed to not drinking the water and not having an increase in blood levels of spermidine, uh, we can see that there was no increase in median lifespan in the rats. So to summarize, polyamines and more specifically, spermidine extends lifespan in mice, but not in rats. So what about uh, spermidine's effects on health in people? So in this study, which uh, was in people, a relatively small study of 829 uh, 67-year-olds, or at least that had an average age of 67, we can, see, we, can evaluate, we can see the cumulative incidence of death, so all-cause mortality on the y-axis, plotted against follow-up, which in this case was 20 years after the baseline visit. So with the baseline visit, they assessed uh, spermidine, spermidine intake by diet and then uh, evaluated how many people died uh, up to 20 years later. So when looking at this data, we can see that the lowest all-cause mortality was present for the group that had the highest spermidine intake, in this case, greater than 11.6 milligrams per day. Significantly higher people died uh, in the group that had lower amounts of spermidine, so in this case, uh, 9.1 to 11.6 milligrams per day. And the highest all-cause mortality was present for people who, or, or was associated uh, with uh, spermidine intakes that were less than 9.1 milligrams per day. Now, in data from the same study, but reported a few years later, future risk for cognitive impairment was also assessed in relation to spermidine intake, which is shown there. So using those same cutoffs, so less than 9, 9.1, uh, 9.1 to 11.6, and greater than 11.6 milligrams per day of spermidine, so low, medium, and high, we can see that the group that had high levels of sperm spermidine had about a 70% reduced risk for future cognitive impairment when compared with the group that had less than 9.1 milligrams of spermidine per day. Now note that these data are associations and we can get uh, more direct, uh, we can evaluate more potential direct effects of spermidine by evaluating it in randomized controlled trials. So does spermidine impact health in RCTs, randomized controlled trials? So to date, there are two studies, two, two RCTs that have evaluated uh, spermidine's effects on cognitive function. In the first, it was on memory performance in older adults at risk for dementia. And this study was relatively small. It included 28 people with an average age of 70 years, and it was a three-month study. So to increase spermidine in the intervention group, the uh, that group was given a spermidine supplement of 1.2 milligrams per day. Now, note that blood spermidine or other polyamine levels were not different between the two groups. So the group getting the supplement and that got placebo. So no difference in blood levels of spermidine or other polyamines. But nonetheless, in this study, they reported a positive impact for spermidine supplementation on memory performance in this older adult cohort, in this older adult cohort that was at risk for dementia. Now, in the second RCT, whereas the first one was in older adults at risk for dementia, in this one, this was in older adults suffering from dementia and evaluating the effect on increasing spermidine intake. And this was a relatively larger study that included 92 subjects, a little bit older age, 83 years, and again, a three-month study. So to increase spermidine levels in the intervention group, uh, wheat germ was added to bread, and then the intervention group ate bread rolls. So in contrast, the control group ate bread rolls that were not enriched with wheat germ. And as we'll see in a minute, wheat germ is a, uh, a, a, con a very concentrated source of spermidine. Now, that, uh, the spermidine in the intervention group resulted in an average increase of about one milligram more spermidine per day when compared with controls, and that was sufficient to raise blood levels of spermidine from 42 to 58 nanograms per mil, so about a 40% increase in the intervention group when compared with controls who did not have a significant increase in their spermidine levels over the three-month study. 
And as a result, there was a, uh, an improvement in cognitive performance in the spermidine uh, supplement or the, the group that had the higher spermidine intake when compared with controls who had consistent or declining cognitive performance over that three-month study. So collectively, uh, when considering the lifespan data, the associate, association data for all-cause mortality and cognitive uh, function, and then these two RCTs, these, these data suggest an important role for spermidine on health. So spermidine can be uh, uh, relatively easily obtained by a diet if we choose wisely. So which foods are rich in spermidine? So I've uh, gathered a list here and note that this list is not comprehensive. Uh, you can see by the three papers that are below the table, uh, this is where I, uh, I gathered this information from. And uh, it's, as I said, it's not a comprehensive list. If you're inter interested in the comprehensive list, I'll put the links to uh, those papers in the video's description. And actually, again, all of the papers that are in this video will be in the video's description. So I've only highlighted the most concentrated sources of spermidine. And so atop the list is wheat germ. And again, this is milligrams of spermidine in, uh, per 100 grams of food. So we can see that by just eating about 30 uh, grams of wheat germ per day, we can get to that about 12 milligram per day cutoff that was associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk in the earlier study. Other good sources of spermidine are the fermented soybean product natto, green bell peppers, mushrooms, which is where I get the majority of my spermidine intake. So I get about 10 milligrams of sper spermidine per day just from mushrooms. I eat a lot of mushrooms. But then also pretty good sources are found in animal products too, including chicken liver and grilled chicken. So uh, by choosing wisely, we, we can uh, relatively easily get that 12 milligrams of spermidine per day. All right, that's all for now. Uh, if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, come check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.